Hello and welcome to e-lectures. Today in this session, I would like to take you on a journey through the steward rule, civil war, puritanism, restoration and the glorious revolution prescribed for semester three students of the University of Kerala. And this comes under the paper British Literature 1. The Tudor dynasty ended with the death of Queen Elizabeth on 24th March 1603. Now, Queen Elizabeth was widely admired for her religious tolerance. Though she had her own religious beliefs and convictions, Queen Elizabeth was secular and tolerant towards other religious practices. However, she left no heir to the throne, leading to the rise of a new dynasty, the Stuarts. The Stuart rule begins with the accession of James I in 1603 after the death of Queen Elizabeth. He was then the ruler of Scotland. In fact, James VI of Scotland on coming to England and ascending the throne became King James I of England. And he was the nearest heir to the throne being the son of Queen Mary who was the daughter of Margaret, one of the daughters of Henry VII. And it was King James I who was responsible for re-establishing the parliamentary supremacy which was stayed under the Tudor dynasty. In fact, there was an initial period of peace. However, it did not last long. And the greatest event during the Stuart rule was the struggle between the king and the parliament. And the major struggle centered on religion, foreign policy, and also the absolute power of the king. The people were not willing to accept autocracy. They did not want the king to overpower them or to rule them on his own accord. King James was an autocratic ruler who firmly believed in the divine right of the king. He wanted absolute power. And unlike Queen Elizabeth I, he was very lenient towards the Catholics and it irritated the Puritans who were growing in power. And their resentment gave the struggle a religious anchor. The Puritans wanted a remodeling of the church. They wanted to abolish episcopacy and establish Presbyterianism. James I was strongly against the abolishment of episcopacy because he believed that if episcopacy were to be uh, abolished, it would endanger monarchy itself. The Puritans submitted a millinery petition before King James I in 1603 itself and it contained all their demands. In order to satisfy them, James I summoned the Hampton Court Conference but nothing came out of it. He was only interested in carrying out certain things that he had in his mind and that resulted in the translation of the Bible into English and the, the publication of authorized version of the Bible in 1611. The Puritans were highly disappointed with the actions of the king and they enjoyed a majority in the House of the Commons. So they started their opposition by refusing revenues to the king and impeaching his ministers. The king quarreled with his parliament and dismissed them. And King James, first, he became extremely tyrannical. He started levying taxes without the consent of the parliament. And the commons, they started asserting their rights and they refused revenues to the king again. And the king came under the strong censure of the commons, especially in the parliament. And therefore, he had no other choice but to summon his parliament. And the first parliament met in 1604. The Puritans urged for many concessions, but the king was not very much willing to show any leniency towards them. And the Puritans, they also rejected because they enjoyed a majority in the commons. They rejected the king's plan of a union with Scotland as well. And this, in fact, increased the conflict between King James I and his parliament. And therefore, he once again dismissed his parliament in 1611. And then a second parliament was summoned and that was called as the adult parliament. And the adult parliament was also highly hostile to the king and they did not give him any grants or permitted him to pass any acts. And therefore, King James I had no other choice, so he dismissed his second parliament again. And there was a summoning of the third parliament in 1621. The Puritans wanted King James I to participate in the Thirty Years' War. 
however king james was not much interested in participating in the war but he took up a policy of negotiation and james first also wanted to marry his son to a spanish princess and that was completely refuted by the parliament and therefore he dismissed his third parliament as well and then he summoned a fourth parliament which granted him liberal revenues but it passed an act declaring the monopolies of the king as illegal now king james first died in 1625 and his son charles first ascended the throne charles first was not much different from his father he was a very popular king initially mainly because of the warlike foreign policies that he had adopted there were no threats from foreign nations and the people started loving him initially but later when he started becoming tyrannical and when he started showing his true color the commons started opposing his foreign policies because they realized that the foreign policies adopted by charles i were mainly driven by his own personal interests this resulted in his quarreling with his parliaments and the quarrel was mainly centered around his intolerance towards the puritans the puritans were also uh, greatly disappointed with his tolerance of catholics and anglicans however charles i was intolerant and he tried to subdue the puritans and this resulted in his continuous and constant quarreling with all his parliaments and in his four years of his reign he summoned as many as three parliaments and he quarreled with all of them and the first parliament was in fact highly furious over his marriage with the catholic princess of france and the favors that he showed towards the catholics and the second parliament went in 1625 and the third parliament was summoned in 1628 all of which he dissolved all of which or with all of whom he had a quarrel so charles first was uh, becoming extremely tyrannical and during the third session the commons led by Eliot they drew up a famous petition of right which is also called as the second great charter which contempt the arbitrary rule of the king and they declared illegal the levying of taxes Charles I just like his father was very famous for levying taxes from the people without any cause or reason therefore they brought this uh, petition of right or called as the second great charter in order to control or in order to curb the powers of the king and using this great great petition or this petition of right or the second great charter they uh, curbed the power of the king and they also made illegal the imprisonment of people without trial and uh, charles first unwillingly had to agree to the terms and conditions laid down by the parliament and uh, however he was not a person who was willing to follow the rules of the country he kept on levying taxes despite the uh, petitions and despite the laws that were passed by the parliament he continued to levy taxes from the people and ultimately because of the great opposition that he had to face from the third parliament he dissolved it as well and for 11 years charles first ruled without a parliament and he became a very tyrannical king and it was the war with scotland which forced him to summon the long parliament in 1640 and that met under the leadership of Pym. and the first thing that the parliament did the long parliament which met in 1640 did was to dismiss all the unpopular ministers of the king and they also wanted to end the unjust taxation so charles first had no other option he ruled without a parliament for 11 years and however because of the war that he had to fight with scotland he required the help of the parliament and that was the reason why he summoned a long parliament in 1640 but the long parliament took care to dismiss all the unpopular ministers of the king and they also ended unjust taxation and they also ensured that the king was totally dependent on the parliament for his financial requirements however an internal conflict divided the members of the parliament the root and branch bill 
uh, was brought up in order to abolish episcopacy and a group of the members of the parliament were opposed to it and this resulted in a in, the, in an internal conflict it resulted in a conflict among the members of the parliament and the king became extremely happy because he was able to take advantage of the differences in opinion and he accused all the leaders of treason and he took it as an opportunity to enter the house of the commons with his soldiers and he arrested them and this was the reason for the civil war which overthrew monarchy executing charles first in 1649 now let's take a quick look at what happened during the civil war the civil war took place from 1642 to 1651 and it was fought between charles first and the parliament the, uh, the followers of charles first were referred to as the cavaliers and the members of the parliament who took part in the war were nicknamed as roundheads so the civil war was fought between the cavaliers and the roundheads and it lasted um, and it took place from 1642 and it lasted up to 1651 charles first was uh, as I mentioned, very tyrannical and he placed himself above the law. And one major reason for the retaliation from the part of the people were the enforcement of the Lord's Prayer because it opposed or it was against the religious practices of the Puritans. Charles I was very adamant on the people following the Lord's Prayer and this was opposed to religious practices, rituals and rites of the part of the Puritans. And uh, there was a long parliament which was uh, summoned in 1640 which was very determined to curb the power of the king. The king refused to pass the bills of the parliament and that resulted in in the war and professor Trevelyan he considers this particular war this civil war as a religious and a political struggle because it was a war that was fought between the king and also the puritans who had an upper hand in the house of the commons and therefore it can be considered as a war which was not just a part of a political struggle because it was also a part of a religious one and the king was mainly supported by the lords and the gentry there were a group of lords and also gentlemen who supported the king who stood with the king and fought against the members of the parliament and the parliament was supported by yeomen and townsfolk people ordinary people because uh, the parliament especially the house of the commons consisted of a majority of puritans and puritans were also growing in number and power in england during the first half of the 17th century therefore the parliament uh, received a lot of support from very ordinary people from the yeomen and townsfolk and king's followers they were called as the cavaliers and the parliamentarians and the supporters of the parliament they were nicknamed as roundheads and the first battle took place at a place called Edge Hill, which was in Warwickshire, and the war was fought on 23rd October 1642. And this civil war witnessed the rise of a man to power. He was a member of the parliament. He grew up as a very ordinary boy. He became a member of the parliament. He was a Puritan and the civil war witnessed his rise and that was Oliver Cromwell. And he was someone who led the civil war. He led the parliamentarians and it was his intelligence, his brilliance and his strategy which helped the parliamentarians to win the war. He re remodeled the parliamentary army and he also got the self-denying ordinance passed and the self-denying ordinance it uh, deprived the parliamentarians many of the members of the parliament of giving commands and he got the power under his control and uh, the uh, the army fought well the soldiers under Cromwell they fought really well and they captured the king in 1645 at a place called Naseby and uh, there was a quarrel between the army and the parliament so uh, just like the internal conflict because of the root and branch bill uh, that demanded the abolishment of episcopacy resulted in the division of the members of the parliament there was a quarrel between the army and the parliament so once again the king got an opportunity to take advantage of the situation and therefore he freed himself and he took control once again and that resulted in the second bout of civil war 
The first civil war took place on 23rd October 1642. It was fought at Edge Hill in Warwickshire, wherein Oliver Cromwell, because of his brilliance and his intellectual strategies, he was able to win the war and he captured the king in 1645. But because of the quarrel that arose between the army and the parliament, the king was able to take advantage of it and he was able to free himself. And that resulted in the king going against the parliament once again and it led to the second round of civil war and the army under Cromwell became successful once again and that resulted in a number of changes. The long parliament was made rump parliament by Cromwell with the help of Colonel Pride and this was a kind of a purgation a uh, deletion or elimination of a number of leaders who were unpopular and who were not important and it was made into a short parliament called as the rump parliament and this was done with the help of colonel pride and this is therefore called as pride's purge and the rump accused charles first of treason and he was executed in 1649 and oliver cromwell took over as lord protectorate and the rump became extremely powerful and they turned into a kind of oligarchy and they became all powerful in the state and on may 19 uh, england was declared as a commonwealth and the royalists they made uh, a number of reasons or rather they uh, tried or made a number of attempts to overthrow the co uh, commonwealth but then Cromwell uh, they, he terrorized his people into submission and Cromwell became extremely powerful and the Stuart rule came to an end temporarily and puritanism rose to power under the protectorship or under the leadership of Oliver Cromwell who was called as the Lord Protector. Now. Oliver Cromwell was born in Huntingdon on 25th April 1599 and he was born as the son of Robert Cromwell and Elizabeth Stewart and he was a member of the third parliament of Charles I and it was the civil war which brought Oliver Cromwell to the forefront and he became one of the greatest generals of England. He was the one who was responsible for the, uh, for the, uh, the victory of the parliament and he was also the mastermind behind the self-denying ordinance and he was the one who organized the iron sides he was the one who remodeled the army and he groomed a group of soldiers who became very powerful in supporting him and fight against charles the first and he was the one major person behind the defeat of the royalists and after the execution of charles first in 1649 the rump abolished the house of lords and also the office of the king and on may 19th england was declared as a commonwealth and england remained a commonwealth from 1649 up to 1653 and the rump also passed a number of acts in uh, the areas of religion law and also finance and they became uh, extremely powerful and took hold of all the legislative uh, powers and a council was formed which consisted of 41 members and they were the ones to carry out the governance and they were they formed the government and the same members were also the members of the rump and therefore the executive and the legislative realms of the country were under the hands or were under the control or were in the hands or under the control of the 41 members therefore the rump became all powerful there were a few people who objected to it such as the levelers they tried to even uh, create a mutiny but they were defeated because oliver cromwell was a strategist he knew how to uh, control he knew how to rule and therefore he was able to uh, subdue all kinds of mutiny and he defeated the levelers and the catholics and the royalists also made a number of attempts to overthrow the commonwealth but Cromwell was very powerful enough to control all of them and the royalist rising that was crushed in 1650 and Prince Charles who was the son of Charles I he fled to France because he had uh, he had to take refuge somewhere he could not remain in England anymore and therefore he fled to France and gradually and slowly the rump started becoming very unpopular and on April 20, 1653 
uh, Oliver Cromwell dissolved the rump and Cromwell also summoned uh, what is called as a barebone parliament which consisted of only his supporters and under or with the help of the barebone parliament he tried to bring in a number of uh, reforms too and he was also the one who drew up the instrument of the government uh, which invested power in a single person because he uh, named himself as the protector he wanted uh, the power to be in his own hand and therefore he uh, formulated the instrument of the government which vested the power on one single individual or one person and thus he became the protector and he was assisted by a council of state and Cromwell named himself or called himself as the Lord Protector and the first protectorate parliament because Cromwell was the person in power and he was assisted by a group of uh, members uh, whom he called as the parliament and the first protectorate parliament met in 1650 54 and uh, it questioned the legality of the government and uh, uh, Cromwell realized that the parliament was going against him so uh, history repeats and Cromwell dissolved it and then the second parliament uh, was summoned in 1656 and that drew up the humble petition and advice and there was also a constitutional document that was drawn up by a group of MPs in 1657 under which Lord Protector Oliver Cromwell was offered the crown and uh, the major intention of offering him the crown was to limit his power and not to extend it. And uh, he did not assume the title of the king because uh, Cromwell was a very intelligent man. Uh, he did not assume the title of the king and the commons they attacked it and the Cromwell and uh, Cromwell dissolved the parliament in 1658 so instead of taking up the title of the king he formed a new house of lords and the commons they attacked it and Cromwell had to dissolve the parliament in 1658 however he died in September and the protectorate also died along with him even though his son Richard Cromwell succeeded him and tried uh, to take control he completely failed in his attempt and therefore General Monk he recalled the long parliament uh, the long parliament that was dissolved once it was recalled again as the convention parliament it was renamed as the convention parliament in 1660 and invited Prince Charles to come and take or ascend the throne and therefore Prince Charles who was the son of Charles I came back and took over the throne as Charles II and thus entered the rule of the Puritans and you can see the rise of a new era of monarchy in 1660 which is referred to or called as the era of restoration. So the restoration of monarchy is said to be the re-establishment of monarchy after the collapse of the commonwealth and the protectorate. Lord Oliver Cromwell died. His son tried to take over, but he had to leave it in the hands of the army and slowly retire. And therefore, General Monk, uh, he called back or invited Charles II to, to come over and take the crown. So the entire period from 1660 to the fall of James II in 1688 is referred to as the restoration of monarchy, is called as the restoration era or the restoration of monarchy. So there was a strong reaction against the Puritans as well as against military control and uh, Charles II he came back promising uh, religious tolerance he promised uh, a toleration towards every religion and religious practices and that is how he came back to power returned to England on May 25 1660 and the parliament was also extremely royalist in their sympathy and the control of the policy they fell to a group of his supporters Charles II was supported by a group of his supporters known as the Cabal it's called as the Cabal Ministry and the Cabal Ministry the name Cabal is formed of the first letters of the names of the five members uh, Clifford C from Clifford A from Arlington B from Buckingham A again from Ashley Cooper who was the Earl of Shaftesbury and L from Lauderdale so these were the five supporters major supporters of Charles II and the policy formation and uh, the governance were mainly done with the help of these five supporters and Charles also issued a declaration of uh, 
which uh, pardoned uh, the Puritans who retaliated against the former king and he also supported parliamentary government and also offered religious liberty. And in 1661, the Convention Parliament, remember the Long Parliament was now renamed as the Convention Parliament, it was dissolved and the Cavalier Parliament came into existence and the chief work of the Cavalier Parliament was the settlement of the church. It was also mainly for religious purpose and the parliament was supposed to be very superior to the king and though uh, Charles II uh, remained under control for quite some time there was this uh, desire deep desire in him to overpower the parliament and that was the reason uh, for his unpopularity and also his deposition later now there are certain features uh, which can be considered to be the hallmark of the restoration era the one was the advancement on colonization the advancement that they received in colonization and the advancement in overseas trade and it was also marked by the dutch was the great plague which troubled them in the year 1665 and also the great fire of london in 1666 and this was the era which witnessed the birth of two of the major parties of England, Whigs and the Tories. And uh, the modesty and decency which were the whole hallmark of the Puritans were all flouted, it were thrown to the winds and the court of Charles II became a place of shameless acts and infidelity. And such kind of extramarital affairs and relationships became a reason for sarcasm as well as satire in the literature of the time. And the spirit of freedom and individualism also gave way to conservatism and conventionalism. However, there was rapid development in the area of science and the Royal Society was founded in 1662. But there was always this widespread affectation and change in attitude mainly because Charles II had come over from France and uh, since he spent much time there in France, he also brought along with him the fashion manners and also customs of France and that uh, slowly started uh, sweeping into English social life and as a result of which class distinction also became prominent during the time and that would that could be uh, very much seen in uh, the emergence of towns villages and also in the arise of a new class of noblemen. And altogether, it can be said that there was widespread affectation and change in attitude, which was different from the English ways of life until 1660. However, Charles II was constantly troubled by religious issues. He was not able to solve the problem between the Catholics and the Protestants. At the same time, he did not have a legitimate heir to the throne. So Charles II died in 1685 without leaving a legitimate heir to the throne and naturally the responsibility of the nation fell on his brother James II and he took over the throne and ruled it until 1688. The parliament, however, was very keen on removing him from the throne because he was a very staunch and strong supporter of Catholicism. At the same time, his close friendship and ties with France also worried them. And this led uh, to his removal and substitution with his daughter Mary, who was married to a Protestant, William of Orange. And it is to be noted that his two daughters, Anne and Mary, were brought up as a uh, Protestants under the insistence of Charles II and Mary was willingly married off to William of Orange who was a Protestant himself and this removal of James II from the throne because of his unpopularity because of his uh, staunch support of uh, Catholicism and his close friendship with France led to what is called as the glorious revolution and the glorious revolution in fact is a bloodless revolution because with the invitation sent to William and Mary of Orange, they came over to England in order to take over the throne and James II fled to France. So no blood was shed during the revolution and therefore the glorious revolution is also called as the bloodless revolution. And uh, there were seven eminent Englishmen including a bishop who sent an invitation to William and Mary of Orange in order to come over to uh, 
England and settle religious issues. And once William accepted the invitation and came over to England, the major responsibility of William was to check the growth and power of French forces because uh, uh, James II had already fled to France and they thought that there would be attack and protest from the part of France and therefore William was asked to check the growth and power of the French forces and the parliament also declared William and Mary as joint authorities of the nation and all those declarations and one important uh, uh, one important change that took place was the convention parliament was converted into a proper parliament and the parliament started taking appropriate decisions regarding uh, the policies of the nation and the declarations were all converted to bills of rights and these bills of rights brought in tremendous changes it in fact altered the contours of uh, england the political and the socio-political contours of england and according to the bill mary's sister anne could succeed her and another important uh, decision was to bar Roman Catholics from uh, becoming kings again. And then it also abolished the power of the crown or the king to suspend laws without the permission of the parliament. And uh, they also declared a standing army as illegal in times of peace. So these were some of the most important decisions adopted by the parliament during the time. And it was all done uh, with the permission and agreement of William and Mary of Orange, who were now the rulers of England. And this was all in agreement with John Locke's uh, contention that a government was supposed to be a social contract between the king and his people who were represented in the parliament. So ultimately, the revolution, in fact, established the parliament as the ruling power of England. So the parliament ultimately gained its complete power. And later, we can also see that uh, Mary uh, dies later and then uh, William becomes the sole ruler and later after the death of William uh, Queen Anne takes over as the ruler of England. So the glorious revolution is a bloodless revolution and it in fact brought in plenty of uh, socio-political changes in England. So I think I have given you a quick review of the Stuart rule and the changes that were brought about in England and thank you so much for your patient listening.